Hello, Saints. I'm Ornette, and this is Zebulun, where truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him who created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. Also known as the Three Angels' Message of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12 and the everlasting gospel. Hope everyone had a nice 4th of July. Today's topic, the great controversy, chapter seven, Luther's separation from Rome. And uh, we're working our way through the book, The Great Controversy, and we're tracking it with the book of Revelations. And we see they go side by side. And the great controversy just gives more details about what's revealed in the book of Revelation, and also Daniel. Um, we're moving through the Dark Ages. We've come to the year 1517, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And if you follow me all the way through these lessons at the end, you're going to fully understand what the mark of the beast is and what the everlasting gospel is, the last message to this earth, because we're very near to the second coming of Christ, and we're living in the last days. And uh, there's much deception going on, but these, this information will help open your eyes and avoid deception. But before we go any further, let's ask the Lord to send His Holy Spirit. Loving Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you're always there. I thank you that you love us so much. You knitted us together in our mother's wombs. The hairs on our head are numbered by you. You love us with an everlasting love. And when we fell into rebellion against you, you came and showed us the way and even died for us. Not only did you die, but you suffered on Calvary's cross. And not only that, but you resurrected. After you, re you rested in the grave during the Sabbath hours, and then after the Sabbath was over, you resurrected and ascended to heaven and functioned in the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. And soon and very soon, your ministry in heaven will end and probation on this earth will close. And he who is righteous will be righteous still. He who is wicked will be wicked still. The sheep and the goat will be separated and you will return to claim your people, to claim your bride. We pray that we will be ready. Everyone in the sound of my voice, I pray that we will be ready. We'll be able to look up and say, no, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's move right along. And uh, so last time we focus on the scriptures and uh, the, what was it? the third and fourth trumpet. It's very good lesson. And we talked about the, uh, the bitter water and the sun, moon, and stars being darkened. And now we're going to look at some of the details that are revealed in the book, The Great Controversy. Um, well, here we are right here. We just looked at the Wormwood and the sun being smitten. So we're in this fourth epoch of time. We're in the year 1517, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. That's why I stuck that date in there. And uh, just a word on the Great Controversy. Um, you can go to YouTube, type in the Great Controversy. We're on Chapter 7. And look, you have it here, 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 here. These are audio books, Luther's Separation from Rome. And uh, if you just click on this one, you'll see. Uh, these are beautiful seven. presentations. Luther's Separation from Rome. <clears throat> Foremost among those who were called to lead the church from the darkness of popery into the light of a pure faith stood Martin Luther, zealous, ardent, and devoted knowing no fear but the fear of God, and acknowledging no foundation for religious faith but the Holy Scriptures. Luther 
was the man for his time. Through him, God accomplished a great work for the Reformation so, um, as a purpose and leading him to deep humility before God. He had an abiding sense of his dependence. Anyway, uh, so you can go to the YouTube and listen to the great controversy being read to you. And I would encourage you to do that uh, if you don't have a book. If you put your address in the comments section, I'll send you a free copy of the great controversy. Um, I have cases of them. Well, case, I have a case of them. I have some more at church. And I'll be glad to send them out if you want one. Also, if you have any questions, uh, things you don't understand, or even if you disagree with something, put it in the comments section and I will reply to it. Uh, also, if you uh, feel that these videos are fruitful, hit the like button so that strengthens the algorithm and allows more people to be exposed uh, to these things. But uh, let's get into this. Okay. Um, last time, remember I had a senior moment. I was telling you that you can rewatch the videos uh, more than once to gain a deeper understanding of some of the things. Look it up in your Bible. Uh, use your concordance. Use your Strong's concordance if you have one. But also, what I for, what I couldn't was going to say and I forgot was that you could also go back to presentation. The previous presentations. If you go all the way back to presentation one, I start out in the sanctuary and I, te I teach a person how to be saved. Because let me say this, understanding the mark of the beast, understanding Bible prophecy, if you're not converted, it means nothing. A lot of people, I think, feel like, oh, if I know what the mark of the beast is, when it comes, I'll avoid it. If you haven't developed a character for Christ, you're going to crumble under the pressure. So the first video explains very clearly from a biblical sanctuary perspective how to be saved, how to walk with God. How do you know that you can know that you're saved? Uh, what's the relationship between the law and uh, justification? and sanctification do we have to obey god's law are we expected to obey god's law all of these things are dealt with early on and so i'm assuming that i'm talking to born again christians right now and that you're walking with god and that you have discernment and uh but anyway you can go back to the first videos i would encourage you to do that because some of these video might be kind of heavy so um we saw in the, well, let's go back to Revelation, uh, to the trumpets. Okay, seven trumpets. Um, and a third angel sounded, and there fell a star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and we talked about those waters is the gospel the gospel message the everlasting gospel and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter so many men died because of false doctrine they were led astray into worshiping idols but not all men and one of the men who didn't die spiritually was martin luther and so um whoops. we see here that uh, luther was not of the men who died from the bitter waters of wormwood he sought diligently for that branch that would make the water sweet when the sun, moon, and stars were darkened, Luther sought that bright and morning star. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to put flesh and bones on the third and fourth trumpets. This time of Reformation, we're going to look at the life of Martin Luther, who lived during this time. 
when the uh, Roman Catholic Church was in full power, but they were teaching uh, Christianity mixed with paganism and teaching many false things and corruption was in the church and persecution was in the church and the Inquisition was going on. We saw what great things God did in answer to the prayer of John Huss's humble mother. Now we're going to look at Martin Luther's uh, prayer life. His life, prayer life, was legendary. It was said that Martin Luther spent two to three hours a day in prayer. Some people say, I'm too busy to pray. He said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer because I have a lot to do, so I need to pray. He also said to pray well is the better half of study. So if you want your study to be fruitful, this is not just Bible study. If you're studying medicine, if you're studying welding, if you're studying carpentry, if you're studying history, whatever you're studying, pray about it and your study will be more fruitful. Uh, Martin Luther's father was a man of strong and active mind and great force of character. Martin Luther had a strong dad. He was honest, resolute, and straightforward. He was true to his convictions of duty, and he, he let the consequences be what they might. This is in the Great Controversy, page 120, paragraph 3. So having a dad is very important. Uh, in these days when the family, uh, there's so many single families and marriage is being frowned upon, frowned upon. The best family, the best environment for a child is a mother and father that are married. And then they have a child and they stay together and that child has a father. It's very important. Don't take marriage lightly. Don't take, uh, it's not adultery. Don't take fornication lightly. If you're not married, engaging in sex, you're breaking the commandments of God. We need to do things decently and in order. And Martin Luther had a strong father. That's why he came out to be a strong man. He had humble beginnings. Great Controversy, page 121, paragraph 2, it says, So great was the poverty of his parents that upon going from home to school in another town, he had to walk to another town to go to school. He was for a time obliged to obtain his food by singing from door to door. And he often, often uh, suffered from hunger. He would go door to door singing for food. And sometimes when he didn't get any food, he just went hungry. When at the age of 18, he entered the University of Erfurt. His situation was more favorable and his prospects were brighter than in his earlier years. His parents having by thrift and industry acquired a competence, they were able to render him all needed assistance. Martin Luther had some godly sacrificing parents, but they were poor. Against his father's wishes, he decided to enter a cloister and devote, devote himself to a monastic life. So he went into a, a monastery, a cloister, and uh, became a Catholic monk. Every moment that could be spared from his daily duties, he employed in study, robbing himself of sleep and grudging even the time spent at his scanty meals. Above everything else, he delighted in the study of God's word. He found a Bible chained to the convent wall, and to this he often repaired. As his convictions of sin deepened, he sought by his own works to obtain pardon and peace. So he began reading the Bible that was chained to the convent wall. Because they didn't believe the common man could understand the Bible or should understand the Bible, but that the church would interpret it for him, which is unbiblical in and of itself. 
and they kept it in the Latin language. He led a most rigorous life, endeavoring by fasting, vigils, and scourgings to subdue the evils of his nature from which the monastic life had brought no release. Scourging is when you hit yourself in the back with whips to punish your own self for your sins. This is legalism. Christ, we're healed by Christ's stripes. His health thus weakened, he was driven to despair. When it appeared to Luther that all was lost, God raised up a friend and helper for him. The pious Stalpitz opened the word of God to Luther's mind and bade him look away from himself, cease the contemplation of infinite punishment for the violation of God's law, and look to Jesus, his sin-pardoning Savior. This is what Stalpitz was telling Martin Luther to do. And the next slide, I have a picture of Stalpitz. This is from the movie Martin Luther, and this is Stalpitz saying those words to Martin Luther, teaching him um, about Christ and his salvation and how to obtain it and how to obtain forgiveness of sins. Instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in him, in the righteousness of his life, in the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. This is what Stalpitz told Martin Luther. His words made a deep impression upon Luther's mind. After many a struggle with long-cherished errors, he was enabled to grasp the truth, and peace came to his troubled soul. Okay. Now, Luther was still at this time, a true son of the papal church, living in a monastery, and had no thought that he would ever be anything else. In the providence of God, he was led to visit Rome. He pursued his journey on foot. He walked to Rome to see the Vatican and to uh, see Rome for himself, lodging at monasteries along the way. At a convent in Italy, he was filled with wonder at the wealth, magnificence, and luxury that he witnessed. These monks were living high on the hog. Endowed with a princely revenue, the monks dwelt in splendid apartments, attired themselves in, ri in the richest and most costly robes, and feasted, feasted at a sumptuous table. With painful misgivings, Luther contrasted this scene with the self-denial and hardship of his own life. His mind was becoming perplexed. Great Controversy, page 124, paragraph 3. His eyes were being opened to the errors in the church. Finally, he entered the city. Finally, he arrives at Rome, visited the churches, listened to the marvelous tales repeated by priests and monks, and performed the ceremonies required. Everywhere he looked upon scenes that filled him with astonishment and horror. He saw that iniquity existed among all classes of the clergy. He heard indecent jokes from prelates and was filled with horror at their awful profanity, even during mass. As he mingled with the monks and citizens, he met dissipation, debauchery, turn where he would, in the place of sanctity, he found profanation. No one can imagine, he wrote, what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. Thus, they are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. It is an abyss which issues every kind of sin. And so Martin Luther was seeing 
the apostasy of the Roman church and the papacy. Let's see, let me go back. Okay, I guess not. By a recent decreto, an indulgence had been promised by the Pope to all who should ascend upon their knees, Pilate's staircase, said to have been descended by our Savior on leaving the Roman judgment hall and to have been miraculously conveyed from Jerusalem to Rome. So in Rome, there was this high staircase called Pilate's staircase. And the papacy taught that it had been transported to Rome and that Jesus had ascended those steps. And if you crawled up those steps on your knees, your sins could be forgiven. Luther was one day devoutly climbing these steps when suddenly a voice like thunder seemed to say to him, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1 17. He sprang to his feet and hastened from the place in shame and horror. The text never lost its power upon his soul. From that time, he saw more clearly than ever before the fallacy of trusting to human works for salvation and the necessity of constant faith in the merits of Christ. And then I inserted these words, the branch was cast into the waters and they were made sweet. You see, climbing the staircase was like the bitter waters without Christ. But when you rely on the righteousness of Christ, it's like casting that branch into the bitter waters and they were made sweet. His eyes had been opened and were never again to be closed. He saw the light to the delusions of the papacy. They were never again to be closed to the delusions of the papacy. When he turned his face from Rome, he had turned away also in heart. And from that time, the separation grew wider until he severed all connection with the papal church. Great Controversy 125, paragraph two. Here's a picture from that same movie of Martin Luther climbing those stairs. And look at all those people climbing the stairs on their knees, thinking that by that by these works, they can receive salvation, when salvation is by faith through Christ and, and his works. And those words from Roman 117 came to uh, Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the finished works of Christ for our salvation. After his return from Rome, Luther received at the University of Wittenberg the degree of Doctor of Divinity. So he had his doctorate in divinity. Now he was at liberty to devote himself as never before to the scriptures that he loved. <clears throat> he had taken a solemn vow to study carefully and to preach with fidelity the word of God, not the sayings and doctrines of the popes all the days of his life. He was no longer the mere monk or professor, but the authorized herald of the Bible. He had been called as a shepherd to feed the flock of God that were hungering and thirsting for the truth. He firmly declared that Christians should receive no other doctrines than those which rest on the authority of the sacred scriptures. Sola Scriptura. These words struck at the very foundation of papal supremacy. They contain the vital principle of the Reformation. Great Controversy, page 126, paragraph one. But light and darkness cannot harmonize. Between truth and error, there is an irrepressible conflict. To uphold and defend the one is to attack and overthrow the other. It's inescapable. If you're gonna share truth, you're gonna attack lies. Our savior himself declared, I came not to send peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. 
said Luther a few years after the opening of the Reformation, God does not guide me. He pushes me forward. He carries me away. I am not master of myself. I desire to live in repose, but I am thrown into the midst of tumults and revolutions. Not my will, but thy will. In other words, the Roman church had made merchandise of the grace of God. The tables of the money changers were set up beside her altars, and the air resounded with the shouts of buyers and sellers. Under the plea of raising funds for the erection of St. Peter's Church in Rome, indulgences for sin were publicly offered by sale by the authority of the Pope. So they would sell these papers called indulgences for the forgiveness of sin, and you just give them some money, and that's the money they used to build uh, St. Peter's Church in Rome. By the price of crime, a temple was to be built up for God's worship, the cornerstone laid with the wages of iniquity, and that iniquity was these indulgences. Those are my words in parentheses. Now, one of the men that was selling these indulgences, his name was Tetzel. Let me read about Tetzel just to give you an idea of, of how they worked, how they operated. As Tetzel entered a town, a messenger went before him announcing, now Tetzel was a seller of these indulgences. And the person who went before him announced, the grace of God and of the Holy Father is at your gates. And the people welcomed the blasphemous pretender as if he were God himself, come down from heaven to them. The infamous traffic was set up in the church, and Tetzel, ascending the pulpit, extolled the indulgences as the most precious gift of God. He declared that by virtue of his certificates of pardon, all sins which the purchaser should which the purchaser purchaser should afterward desire to commit would be forgiven him, and that not even repentance is necessary. Do you get that? You pay this certain amount of money, and whatever sins you commit, even in the future, are automatically forgiven. You don't even have to repent. You can see what this would lead to. More than this, he assured his hearers that the indulgences had power to save not only the living, but the dead. Because the church, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church was teaching the immortality of the soul instead of death sleep. When you die, you just sleep until the resurrection. But they taught people were in purgatory still alive and they had immortal souls. And it leads to these kind of errors. That the very moment the money should clink against the bottom of his chest, the soul in whose behalf it had been paid would escape from purgatory and make his way to heaven. So if he had a person who wasn't quite fit for heaven and they were in purgatory suffering, you paid a certain amount and they'd be released into heaven. The Bible clearly teaches that heaven cannot be purchased like that. I remember, what's his name? Simon Magnus tried to sell uh, God's grace and, and, and the Bible, uh, let's just say, frowned upon that. Great Controversy, page 127 to 128. Here's a here's an artist rendition of Tetzel selling indulgences to these poor people. Luther, though still a papist, Luther is still a, a papist. He's still a Roman Catholic. He's just trying to reform the errors in his church. But it's going to put him on a collision cor cor course with the Pope. Though still a papist of the straightest sort was filled with horror at the blasphemous assumptions of the indulgence mongers, like Tetzel. Many of his own congregation had purchased certificates of pardon, and they soon began to come to their pastor confessing their various sins and expecting absolution, 
not because they were penitent and wished to reform, but on the grounds of the indulgence. So they were coming to him with these papers saying, look, you have to forgive me. They weren't even repentant. Luther refused them absolution and warned them that unless they should repent and reform their lives, they must perish in their sins. In great perplexity, they repaired to Tetzel. That just means they went back to Tetzel with the complaint that their, that their confessor had refused his certificates. And some boldly demanded that their money be returned to them. <laughs> this uh, indulgence didn't work. The friar was filled with rage. So Tetzel was a friar, which is a form of monk, where they live in monasteries. And, and he got rich selling these indulgences. He uttered the most ter terrible curses, or caused fires to be lighted in the public squares, and declared that he had received an order from the Pope to burn all heretics who presume to oppose his most holy indulgences. Great Controversy 128 and 129. He, Luther, counseled the people not to buy the indulgences, but to look in faith to a crucified Redeemer. As Tetzel continued his traffic, and his impious pretentiousness, Luther determined upon a more effectual protest against these crying abuses. So here you have a battle between Luther and Tetzel. An occasion soon offered. So Martin Luther has an idea, and this is going to be the start of the Protestant Reformation. The castle church of Wittenberg possessed many relics. Relics are like uh, bones uh, or parts or mummies of people that have died or even parts of their uh, possessions, their hair. Um, so the castle church of Wittenberg possessed many relics, which on certain holy days were exhibited to the people. And full remission of sins was granted to all who then visited the church and made confession. So when they had these relics out, this hair or this hand or this mummy, if you came on that day, your sins were forgiven. This is why they didn't want people reading their Bible, because so they would believe this, this kind of teaching. Accordingly, on these days, the people in great numbers resorted thither. One of the most important of these occasions, the Festival of All Saints, that's uh, October 31st or, or November 1st, it's right around there near Halloween, was approaching. On the preceding day, Luther joining the crowds that were already making their way to the church, posted on its door a paper containing 95 propositions against the doctrines of indulgences. So, so he had 95 reasons why this doctrine of indulgences was unbiblical and people should stop buying them. He declared his willingness to defend these theses the next day at the university. So he said, I'll be at the university tomorrow. You can come and debate, debate me from the Bible about this if you want against all who should see fit to attack them. This is the Great Controversy, page 131, paragraph 2. I mean, 131 and 132. And then these are my, my words. Thus began the Protestant Reformation. I forgot I have one more picture. Here's a picture of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. This is in the year 1517, and this marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Now, next time on Zebulun, we're going to look at Luther's separation from Rome, part two. And we're going to look at, this is the beginning of the Reformation, and we're going to follow it along uh, to the end of chapter seven. And then when we go into chapter eight, um, so next time we'll finish chapter seven. Let us have a word of prayer as we close. Father God, we thank you for the courage of that you gave Martin Luther 
to teach sola scriptura, to teach people Bible truths over the lies of the papacy, over the buying of indulgences, over the lies about purgatory and the state of the dead. We pray, Father God, that your light would shine in our hearts like it did during the Reformation, Father God. Be with us until next time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Until next time, saints.